So this is a quick talk to show that God knows a lot about astrophysics and it's all encoded in the Bible and in fact modern day, even more than modern day astrophysics is encoded in there. So we start off with um, Isaiah 40.22 which says that he, which is God, this is the King James, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth now you can't sit on a circle, it's a two-dimensional hollow line, a circular line. You can sit on a disc, but it doesn't say disc, it says circle. You can sit on a sphere though, and it can mean sphere, it can mean circle, but here obviously if you're sitting on it, it means sphere. So God knew the earth was circular. I mean the reason it says sitting is because he because he sits in judgment over us. He doesn't stand on the earth because he doesn't rule over us. But Abraham said, is the judge of the whole earth not going to do what is right? So he judges, he sits like a judge in judgment, but he doesn't stand to rule or exercise secular authority over us. In fact, he doesn't exercise religious authority over you unless you're in the true church and there's precious few people who are in that. However, it's apparent that when Isaiah wrote that scripture 800 years before Christ that he was inspired to write that God is sitting on a circular earth which means it has to be obviously spherical otherwise it would cut him in half and then he says the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers I love that because the the characteristic of a grasshopper is that it, it is the animal which I'm not sure whether the flea does better but it can jump an enormous amount compared with its body weight because of its huge legs. So here we are grasshoppers trying to jump off the planet and we do occasionally succeed and get to the moon or to a space station and we want to get to Mars. So we're grasshoppers. And then it says that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, says King James, the New World says as a fine gauze. Young's literal says as a very thin thing. <laughs> She's extremely literal, but not very poetic. And then it says, and spreadeth them out as a tent in which to dwell. So he's stretching and he's spreading the heavens. Right? It said twice, this concept of stretching, spreading. Now, it wasn't discovered that the heavens were expanding until 1929 when Hubble deduced it from the redshift, the Doppler shift in light due to relativity, actually due to moving, the relativistic Doppler shift. So 800 years before Christ, 2700 years before Hubble, Isaiah wrote that God was stretching out and spreading out the heavens. That's incredibly prescient. Then, here's the great thing, as a tent to dwell in, or as a tent in which to dwell. So, we will dwell in the heavens, all of them. We will become a spacefaring nation and we will dwell in the entirety of the heavens. They are for us to dwell in. They are our tent. In fact, we already are a spacefaring race because our ancestors from Eden 2 have arrived in an ark to rescue us from the impending attack from the descended demons on us. But that is an interpretation which has no credibility at all, other than Peter says it will occur actually in, in his letters. So, those are two ways in which God was prescient in, with, with Isaiah, and, and then a prophecy, the third thing, that will dwell in the heavens. So we see that it has in it knowledge that the earth is a sphere, and that the universe is expanding and that, well, it has a prediction that we will dwell in the universe. It's our tent. But then I want to come to this wonderful scripture, let there be light. And when you first read that, you think, well, why on earth did God say that? What did he do, turn the lights on? I mean, surely he should have said, let there be the universe. I mean, that's what the Big Bang created. It created space-time. 
so why did God say let there be light? Why didn't he say let there be the universe, let there be space, let there be time, let there be planets, let there be galaxies, let there be superclusters, let there be black holes, etc. Well, we've recently, well, it was Einstein and Mickelson Morley and Lorentz and Poincaré who discovered that really Einstein nailed it with special relativity. That space and time are not, first of all, they're not independent. Secondly, they're not fundamental, they're, they're not invariant. The fundamental and invariant thing in the entire universe in which we live is the speed of light, it's light. From that, space and time flow. We think, in this world in which we live, that time is absolute and invariant and independent from space which is absolute and invariant. And we think that speed is something you can change because you can change the speed at which you walk, the speed at which your car goes, the speed of anything you can change, but you can't change the speed at which time travels in our experience or space. And so we believe, from all of our experience, that time and space are invariant and the, and the speed isn't. And that's why it seems strange to us that God would say, let there be light. Why didn't he say, let there be you know, galaxies and space and let there be time? However, Einstein showed with special relativity that it's light that is the constant thing that is invariant. And space and, and time are not. They are, first of all, dependent upon each other. Uh, they're not independent. And secondly, they change the speed at which time passes depends on how fast you're going. If you're going near the speed of light, time comes to a standstill. And if you're going near the speed of light, space becomes contracted to almost being non-existent. In fact, at the speed of light, there is no time and there is no space. And really, when the Big Bang occurred, light went out in a ball, and inside that ball is space-time, and outside that ball, there is no space-time because space-time is the, what's created in the wake of light. So, by saying, let there be light, Moses, who wrote Genesis 1, was inspired by somebody who knew that space-time was dependent on light, not the other way round. And that wasn't discovered till Einstein in 1905. Jesus said, who of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his lifespan? Well, lifespan is a measure of time. A cubit is a measure of space. It's actually the length of your forearm. Jesus is using the cubit as a measure of time. In other words, he's saying space and time are related. That wasn't known until Einstein came along. And Lorentz, actually. That, so that was known in 1880-something, 1890-something. So God said, let there be light rather than let there be a universe and let, or let there be space-time. And Jesus said, who of you by being anxious can add one cubit to his lifespan? Both indicating that they understood that space-time, well space and time are related, they're not independent and they are secondary to the speed of light, to light, rather than the other way around. So, you put all that together and you see that the, the writer of, and the inspirer of Genesis and Isaiah knew that light was the fundamental thing, not space-time. He knew that the heavens were expanding, stretching out the heavens. And he knew that the, the planet was circular. So these are these acute proofs that the Bible is as relevant today with our present understanding of astrophysics as it was when Isaiah wrote it, or Moses wrote it, and it was prescient to the tune to, in the amount of 3,500 years in the case of Genesis 1. But there's more, because there is the Munro's hypothesis, which Bev Munro's came up with when speaking to me, which is the following. I mean, she came up with the hypothesis, but I kind of saw how to prove it in Genesis. Because the problem from a scriptural standpoint is this. The universe is supposedly 13.8 billion light years long, big, because the furthest 
stars are 13.8 billion light years away from us. And therefore it's deduced that it's been around for 13.8 billion years. And if that's the case, God has been kind of twiddling his thumbs for 13.8 billion years. And in the last 6,000 years, he created man. He sent his firstborn angelic, well, his firstborn angelic son was Satan, who lost his life by trying to kill Adam. Then he sent another angel, well, Michael volunteered to fix it. Michael got divinity as a result. And all these incredible important things, the first of his angelic sons becoming a god and his firstborn angelic son Satan losing his rights and sinning so as to incur death and, and man learning to write and inventing the wheel and becoming civilized. All this happened in, in the space of 6,000 years after Adam and nothing much happened for the 13.8 billion years prior to that. So it, it seems a completely daft sequence of events. And so Bev's solution was, well, maybe, she said, when I'm in the office and I've got nothing to do, time goes really, really slowly. And when I've got loads to do, time goes really, really quickly. Maybe God has a sort of controller for the speed of time, and he can speed it up and slow it down. And so then I looked at Genesis 1, and it says, God was calling the light day, and the darkness he called night. Then it says, there came to be an evening and morning, a first day. This is a came to be an evening morning, a second day. Now, if he's calling the light day, and there's a first day and then a second day, then there must be a first light and then a second light. And in fact, since there were seven days, created days, in Genesis 1, which aren't literal days, but are epochs, if you like, and like Queen Victoria's day, there are seven speeds of light. And cosmologists know that something has to go faster than the speed of light at some point and it's called inflation and that, it, that is required after the Big Bang in order that you get the cosmic background radiation as uniform as it is. So here is my Genesis 1 fix for inflation. The speed of light took a different value in each created day. With that you don't need inflation because you don't go faster than the speed of light ever, which is impossible. You just change the speed of light. And all the seven days were just seven different speeds of light. And so, in other words, the universe is not 13.8 billion years old at all. Because the speed of light isn't, or wasn't in the past, what it is today. Imagine that the speed of light was a million times faster when the Big Bang occurred. That would mean that the universe is 13.8 thousand years old, not 13.8 billion years old. And that would make a lot more sense. I mean, I don't think that's true. We, we've kind of worked out from the scriptures what, how old we think it is. It's about 100,000 years old, we think, in terms of experienced time, or whatever that is, because the speed of light has altered seven times. So there is the Bible actually leading cosmology rather than trailing it, although it led it for 3,500 years, but we didn't realise when it said that, we, that, that God was stretching out the heavens and when he said, let there be light, rather than let there be space, or let there be time, or let there be matter. This brings, so that's really the prophetic content of this talk. Okay, so now I want to try and address the special relativity in a way that doesn't confuse the viewer. Because it confused the hell out of me when I had to study it at Cambridge. I had a terrible teacher who didn't address any of the issues that really matter. And got completely confused. Now there's several sources of confusion that occur in special relativity. The first of them is, or for me, was that when you have a light clock and light's bouncing up and down between the two mirrors, when you observe that clock you have to do it with light. And it's very difficult to see, once you start saying, well wait a minute, we're going at relativistic speeds, you can't just make an observation with light, because what about the effect of that? Well, how does relativity affect that? So there's confusion number one. How on earth are you going to observe any of these wonderful things with all these clocks doing stuff? Because you have to observe it with light. And, but you're trying to solve for what light is doing, and you can't do that if you're observing it with the very thing you're trying to solve for. And there's a, the fix for that is to do it with sound, and to use a sound clock, and to have a, a wall, two walls and sound bouncing up and down, and examine what happens to sound. Because you can do that. Sound goes at 330 metres a second. Light goes at 300 million metres a second. Light is a million times faster than sound, basically. So you can obviously see very accurately what's going on with sound using light. 
So that's how you fix the first confusion. The second confusion is that if, in the case of a light clock, you have person A who's supposedly stationary and person B who's moving with respect to person A, and they both have a clock, a light clock with two mirrors and light bouncing up and down. So person A has a, his clock and person B has his clock. And when person B looks at his clock, it's going up and down. And when person A looks at his clock, it's going up and down. But when person A looks at the person B clock, he sees it doing a hypotenuse. And when person B looks at person A's clock, he sees it doing a hypotenuse. And so what happens in the case of light is that person A sees person B's clock moving, uh, ticking slowly or taking longer to do a tick. And, then, and this is another source of confusion. The third source of confusion, before I finish the second source, is that they call it time dilation. But time isn't dilated. In relativity, lengths are contracted and they say time is dilated. And then you look at the Lorentz transformation and you say, see that x dash is gamma x and t dash is gamma t. In other words, the same thing happens to time as happens to space. And if that didn't happen, the speed of light wouldn't be a constant. So time is not dilated. Time units are dilated and length is contracted. Time is contracted or constricted. It is not dilated. Time units are dilated. We might as well say, well, length units are dilated. You could call it length unit expansion if you wanted. So th these are the three levels of confusion. First of all, how on earth do you make the observations using light if you're trying to work out what light's doing? The, the fix to that is sound. Secondly, don't use time dilation. It isn't time dilation, it's time unit dilation. Use the term time constriction or time retardation or time contraction. Because when you have a moving clock and the tick is, takes longer, then the amount of ticks you have is less, so the time is shorter, but the time unit is longer. That's an incredible, confusing thing that confuses the hell out of people, difficult enough to work out what's going on. But when you use absolutely the wrong term for time, you get scuppered completely. So it's length contraction and it's time contraction or constriction. It's time unit dilation, but that doesn't help at all. So that's the Lorentz problem. Then the next problem is that you've got this person A with a stationary clock, supposedly, and a and moving person A, B, with a, with a moving clock, light clock. And, and the, the each one, when he looks at his clock, he sees the light going doing, doing, uh, doing that. But when he looks at the other guy's clock, he sees it doing a hypotenuse. So it takes longer. And person A thinks that his clock is working fine, but person B's clock is slow. And person B thinks that his clock is working fine, and person A's clock is slow. Then you end up seeing that time isn't absolute at all, it depends on the relative speeds of the observers. And it gets really confusing because you get relativity everywhere. And the fix for that, in my opinion, is to go to what Lorentz came up with, which is called the Lorentzian ether theory, which gives you exactly the same results as, as special relativity, but it gives you a, a frame of reference to which, which you base everything from. Now, Special relativity says there is no preferred frame of reference at all. They're all exactly equivalent. So you don't know whether person A is stationary or moving, you know whether person B is stationary or moving. All you know is person A is moving with respect to person B, and person B is moving with respect to person A, and it all becomes like a, a French philosophy lesson. You don't need to do that, and, and the, the reason they prefer that, so they say today, to Lorentzian ether theory, which I'll go into in a minute, is that they say, well, you can't detect a Lorentzian ether, therefore it doesn't exist. But that argument might, might have been a good one 50 years ago, but it's no good today because we couldn't detect the Higgs boson for about 50 years after Professor Higgs proposed it, and then we did detect it. But, so it didn't mean it didn't exist because it wasn't detected. It, it, didn't, it did exist, but it wasn't detected. Well, the same could be absolutely true of the Lorentzian ether. Furthermore, the whole of cosmology is dependent upon dark matter and dark energy, which is yet to be detected. So the idea that you can't have a Lorentzian ether because it's not being detected is completely obsolete. Secondly, it's all very well saying in special relativity, oh, well, the speed of light is constantly independent of the speed of the observer, as long as it's inertial and not accelerating. But why? The reason that the speed of light is constant is because it's travelling in a medium. We know that the sound, speed of sound is constant because it's going through air and its speed is, is constant with respect to the medium in which it travels. Why would the same not be true of light? That's why Michelson Morley thought that it, what light was travelling in an ether. So what you do in, to get around this problem of everything's blooming relative, which just makes everything impossible to understand, 
or very difficult or very philosophical it is you say okay sound travels through what's called a Galilean ether which is basically air or fluid and a Galilean ether is one where velocities add up in the way we normally expect them to add up so that if, if you have a, a, a clock moving at speed v and you look at a, a transformation into the coordinates of a axis system moving with the clock you find that a primed axis system x primed in the moving axis is just x minus vt where v is the speed of the moving clock that's a Galilean transformation now that transformation doesn't work in relativity because time and space get screwed up by this factor gamma and gamma is the basically the length of the hypotenuse is by applying Pythagoras gamma is, is 1 minus v squared over c squared the square root of it which is the hypotenuse well that's 1 over gamma actually which is the, the hypotenuse of this moving light clock or moving sound clock and the Lorentz transformation which we haven't yet deduced is how you relate a moving frame of reference with coordinates x dash t dash x prime t prime to a stationary frame of reference with coordinates x and t in terms of relativity, special relativity and light. Now light travels at the same speed independent of any observer. You use that information to deduce the Lorentz transformation. Once you've got that transformation you can say well let's have a Lorentzian ether not a Galilean ether because the reality is that space-time is Lorentzian, it is not Galilean. So that's the Lorentzian ether theory. And with that you can say there is a preferred frame of reference, the Lorentzian ether. And then the question is, well, what speed is that going at? Or what's it doing? And I've got a proposal for that, which is the following. We know with quantum computers that a qubit is not naught or one until light shone on it, at it. The reason that they can be so fast is that rather than a regular bit that's either naught or one the whole time, a qubit is neither. Well, it can be naught, it can be one, it can be anything in between, it can, it can be both, it can be a linear combination, it can be all sorts. And it's only when you shine a light at a qubit that it decides whether it's a naught or a one and the probability of which it'll be is data which can be used. Likewise with the universe, we know that it's some kind of a quantum foam. So here's the hypothesis. Let there be light, quantum foam everywhere. Big Bang, light starts travelling through the quantum foam. When it hits the quantum foam, the quantum foam without light doesn't know what time it is and doesn't know where it is. And when the light hits the quantum foam, it goes, oh my goodness me, it's half past six and I'm in Bognor Regis. <laughs> Well, I'm halfway between Alpha Centauri and Betelgeuse. With that, you see light travelling through a quantum foam medium, which is Lorentzian. And then you're back in the exact same situation you will be with sound, but rather than a Galilean transformation, you have a Lorentzian transformation. And you understand why light always travels at the same speed, because it's doing it with respect to a medium and it's a wave. I mean, light is a wave. It, waves have to excite a medium. And that is some kind of a quantum foam, perhaps. Anyway, the advantage of the quantum foam, or the, the Lorentzian ether theory, is you can say, all right, we've got this fixed frame. It's, say, stationary with respect to the centre of mass of the universe, more or less, assuming that the, all the centre of the mass of the universe is stationary with respect to the quantum foam, and I'm not even sure how you would define stationary, really, with respect to quantum foam. It doesn't know when it is or where it is. But you don't need to deny yourself a fixed frame of reference. The Lorentzian ether theory gives you that. And the, the most natural one would be a frame that was stationary with respect to centre of mass of the universe, wherever that is. So that's how I can get around the three, the three most confusing things in special relativity. First of all, the, um, the fact that you're making observations in light to try and work out what light's doing. You fix that with sound. Then we fixed the ridiculous misnomer of time dilation by recognizing that the units of time are dilated which means that the number of those units is, is reduced or contracted or constricted so you have length contraction and time contraction and if you contract them both you preserve the speed of light which is what you have to do the idea that you look at the Lorentz transformation x dash equals 
gamma x minus gamma vt and t dash equals gamma t minus gamma vx over c squared and you say oh we're going to do dilate one and contract the other it is completely contradictory you don't you contract them both and then all this relativity where we don't know whether a is moving in respect to b or b is moving in respect to a you can fix that by saying well actually let's say that a is stationary with respect to the Lorentzian ether of the quantum foam which we assume is stationary with respect to central mass universe if you do that then you can say well b is moving with respect to this ether and then you have some idea of what you're talking about the only thing is that I don't know that B is moving with respect to the ether. Yes, it doesn't matter that B is moving with respect to the ether. Light always moves at the same speed with respect to the ether, but B sees it moving. Yes, B sees yeah, that's the whole point. B sees it moving at the speed of light. Right, yeah, it's important to get this. So if A is stationary with respect to the ether and B is going at 0.86 times the speed of light or gamma equals 2 with respect to the ether then A will see that light going at the speed of light B will see light going at the speed of light A will see but, but the coordinates of B with respect to A and with, which is with respect to the ether B will have his time halved. It, it'll be going twice as slowly. And distance is halved. They'll be twice as small, which will preserve the speed of light. He will still see light going at, at the speed of light. But it, with respect to the ether, he sees distances halved, and he sees time slowed down by a factor of two, which preserves the speed of light. And then if this guy B is going almost at the speed of light, He'll see time almost standing still and distances contracted to almost nothing and yet it will still preserve the speed of light. And that's a lot easier to understand than we don't know who's moving with respect to whom. That's the confusions. Now, I've done the, I won't do the derivations on this video because I've got animations, but if you go to website, it'll be truebiblecode.com forward slash relativity.html you can see the Lorentz transformation deduced and avoiding all the confusions that I've tried to elucidate in this talk. Thanks.